This person who's supposed to experience eternal death has now been transformed to go experience and is now experiencing eternal life. And those who when transformation happens, now you bring them back to where you guys are to be trained in incorporation process. You got that? But that's what friendship evangelism is all about. Okay, so you may have a lot of questions. Now, you're talking about pastor. The Bible says a while ago, I thought you told us in the Word that you've got to go out to the world and make disciples. Right? You're talking about a person. God's talking about the world. How am I going to do that? It's going to be very difficult. Is that, is that possible even to do? Yeah, it is possible. Well, in fact, God gave us a strategy on how you and I are going to be able to make it. Okay? So how does friendship evangelism work? Let's read it all together. What does it say? Anything that works must first be implemented. What does implement mean? Simply putting it to work. Implementation is just work at it. Work it. Okay, Nike? Just do it. Okay? That's what implementation actually means. So how do you implement that? God, Jesus himself, the Son of God, gave us this wonderful command that gives us a beautiful strategy of how we could reach the world starting from even one person or the closest to us. Acts 1.8 says, everybody, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. If you look at it, by the way, those of you who may not know that Israel is, the, Jerusalem is exactly the center of Jesus' ministry, although it's Galilee, okay? Galilee, but Jerusalem is where he was born, it's where he was crucified. And that's where you've got to start. That's where the apostles were. Jerusalem. And then after that, Judea. It's like saying North Hollywood and then L.A. County. Okay? So start with North Hollywood and then L.A. County and then Samaria and then the uttermost spot of the earth. Now when you look at it in relational aspect, this is geographical, so it keeps on expanding. And if you look at it in relational aspect, Jerusalem could be your most immediate family. You start out from where you are. Okay? You don't have to go anywhere. Do you know? Then later, I'm gonna tell you. Okay, but you start out with your family. And then you extend towards your neighbors. That's your Judea. And then Samaria, I don't call them this. But the society somehow categorizes them as the marginalized or the insignificant people. The Jewish people looked at the Samaritans or the Samaritans as insignificant people that they didn't want to even talk to. And then later on, basically, the strangers, uttermost part of the earth, uttermost part of the earth. All of those things, geographical places, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Jesus would have a lot of excuse not to go to them. Jerusalem were the people who rejected him and have him crucified. Okay? And you can all have reasons not to go there. But he asked us to actually evangelize them. And by the way, as you're expanding, rest assured that you're not the only one doing this. That's the reason why the world could really be reached by the gospel. Okay? So we can really say there's nobody to share to. Or I don't really know anybody. Because if you look at those lists alone, family, neighbors, and significant people or strangers, you know you know somebody. So when you say, I don't know who to invite on friend day. Now, by the way, let me just ask you. How many of you have invited people for friend day already? And they've said yes. Raise your hands. I know so many people already. There you go. We've got some. Some of us still haven't. My encouragement to you is, go ahead and do it. Because when we say, I don't really know anybody, that just becomes a big, big excuse. That's the euphemistic way of saying it. Okay? I'm not saying there's a big lie. I'm saying it's a big excuse. It's up to you if you take it the other way around. All right. Now, just look at this list right here. People I know. Okay? Just, I'm not talking about people everywhere in the world that you probably know on Facebook. You don't even, you know, I want you to think of people that you know on a first name basis. Okay? People you know on a first name basis who live somehow within 10 or 20 miles of the church. Let's say, for example, 15 miles of the church. Do you know people who you know on a first name basis who live about 15 miles of the church? And who you know does not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know anybody like this? Okay? Now, look at this Bible in ways. Immediate family, do you know anybody? Immediate family, who does not know the Lord. You know by first name. I hope you know them by first name. Okay? All of those things. Just think about it. Every single one of those people. When you look at those things, sometimes you look at them as categories or statistics. But I want to remind you, every single one of those names that you're thinking about right now 
are people, souls, special souls that Jesus Christ died for. So many times we look at the statistics, but in reality, they're very important to Christ. He died on the cross for them, and if they're the only ones who are, who are left on the earth, or the only people on the earth, Jesus would have still died for them. They are important. So if we haven't really invited them or shared the gospel to them, you've got to do something about it. All right? Are you here with me? Okay. Now, you're saying, but I don't really know, Pastor. What do I do? I don't know what to say. How many of you want to share the gospel to people, but that's the problem you have? I don't know what to say. Raise your hand. Okay? Many of you that also. Only Lance is raising his hand. Two of them. Right? So many of you, I'm expecting you know what to say. Right? That means to say you're sharing the gospel. Okay. So I hope you are. Okay, but if you don't know what to say, for those people who don't know what to say, or still want to develop what to say. Do you want to know? You know, do you want to know a miracle key in sharing the gospel? To know what to say? How many of you want to know? Raise your hand. Okay, we got now about four people, five, okay. How many of you want to know? Raise your hand. So that you can bring people to Christ and know what to say. A lot of you I know are very, very conversant. I mean, it takes, it takes skills for a person to stop you from talking. But some of us like me, you need skills to get it out of me. Because I don't know what to say, really. But for us to know, and this is a good, good key for me as well. It's a miracle key. They said, this is what you got to do. You got to listen. Okay? You just, for you to know, for us to know what to say, the key is listening. And by the way, by listening, all of these are involved. Eye contact. You do not listen and look everywhere. Okay? Have you heard somebody, have you ever spoken to some people, and while you're talking, they look everywhere? Okay. What does it tell you? Not interested. So when you're listening, you got to make sure that you're showing the people, not just by, by you saying, I want to listen to you, but by your body language, that you're really interested with them. Eye contact. Facial expressions. Don't yawn while you're listening to them. You know, some of you have that, have the capacity to be able to like yawn and not show it. Have you ever done that? Yeah. I've seen people do that. I'm talking to them, counseling them, and they yawn inside of them. <laughs> but you got to show through everything, their facial expressions, questions, uh-huh, but what about this? Your responses, your questions. You're not interrupting them. So a lot of people I know, while I'm talking, they stop you. Or while you're talking, they stop. Why? Because while you're talking, they're thinking about what to say. They're not really interested. You've got to be interested with people. You know why? Because God counts them as special. And by the way, you're not just being interested with them because friendship evangelism told me that I should do these things. You've got to really be interested with souls because these are, again, souls that are important to God. Following? Yes. All right? So if you look at this, you get a family. You get, these are the things that somehow concerns your friend. Okay? Finances, health, future. You've got all those things there. And when you're listening, you've got to take a look at all those things. Are they happy? Did they just experience success in life? Are they fearful? Do they have hurt, guilt, anxiety, worry, grief, sorrow, anger? Aside from those two things, most of them are negative already. You've got to genuinely sympathize with them and not be apathetic towards them. So we may be doing all of these things just because it's something we got to do. God wants us to be literally involved with them. And this is something that I want Christianity to know because even business world out there is telling people already, businesses out there are telling their people, their workers, to go out there and develop relationship. And if the business world out there offering great things, great dividends, financial, great business opportunities, if the world out there is telling people that, how much more should we? Because we've got something much, much greater to share than any of those businesses. So the more we got to make friends with people. See? So you got to be able to show the people. By the way, well, pastor, shouldn't I talk? I, I want to share the gospel. Is the gospel important? Yes or no? Is the gospel important? Yes or no? Answer. Is the gospel important? Can you share the gospel without talking? Can you share the gospel without talking? Some say yes, some say no. Okay, how can you share the gospel without talking? Show your life. Has anybody gotten saved by showing your good works? Without talking? 
Okay? Jody serving in the church. She's cleaning. And while she's cleaning, she helps the poor people. And then she helps an old lady cross the street. And then she performs a miracle through the Lord's power. And then I'm noticing everything. And after she did that, I went, Jesus, I need you in my life. Has anybody gotten saved without you presenting the gospel to them? No. The answer is no. We've got to talk. Yes, it's important for us to talk. But... And it's a very important knowledge you possess, but we've heard it over and over, guys. Okay, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The only way they're gonna open up to you and listen to what you know is if they see first that you really care for them. Okay, it's something that's very, very important. So you've got to listen. That's a miracle key for friendship evangelism. All right. So now when we care, then closeness or intimacy gets developed. Intimacy or closeness is not usually automatic. You've got to actually cultivate it. And here's the way you cultivate this. You've got all those um, levels of a person and how you get acquainted with them. Okay, you get acquainted with these people, unknown people, people you haven't met yet, or you've barely met, or you've at least talked things a little bit. Okay, you got to get acquainted with them. And that's one part of cultivating relation. You've got to keep them growing closer and then, now you develop not just talking about things, now you start opening up with ideas. And people become more comfortable with you now, and they start talking about ideas, and they start talking about feelings, then you're getting closer. And then you develop that closeness, now they start opening up about their needs to you. Now you're getting more intimate with people. And now they're open to your counsel, they trust you, and then they're open to your prayer. Okay, now they fully trust you. That's the time God is saying, now that you've developed, now that you've cultivated the ground, now that you've planted a seed, it's time for the harvest. But all of these things, and many times, many of us want to do a dynamite fishing. You know what dynamite fishing is? We don't put up the net. We don't put a bait or anything. We just want dynamite fishing. You see, when you're fishing, you've got a process. When you're farming, you've got a process. You've got to cultivate the ground, do a lot of our preparations. That's how God told us to evangelize and catch fish. It's a process, but many of us don't want to go through it. We just want, what? I got a soul. Harvest. Have you ever harvested anything without planting anything? Or have you, have you ever harvested after you planted a seed? Like, plant the seed, harvest. Many of us want to share the gospel right now and then harvest right away. So for fishing, that's dynamite fishing. What is that? All the fish are there. I don't have a net. I don't have a bait. Here's the dynamite. Throw it. Boom. Everybody dies. They float. Okay, I get them. See, which may not be very beneficial. It's a process. We've got to spend time with them. we got to really love them. And right now, they use the word love on them. I don't know why. Okay? We've got to really love on them. I don't know. But, okay, love on them or love them. This is what it is. You've got to show care and concern for people for us to be able to get their trust. So tips for cultivating. Number one, be patient. Cultivation takes time. But beware that you do not over-cultivate. Okay, everybody say it. Don't over-cultivate. What do you mean by that? A person's already begging you, I want to get saved. And you're still going, cultivate more. Cultivate more. You know what? I want to show you that Jesus really is the Son of God. I want Him. Do you know about salvation by grace? But I want Jesus. How do I get saved? Do you know about the rapture?